Hello, I'm Derek Walker. I'm the pastor of the Oxford Bible Church. And today we're continuing our study from last time of an amazing prophecy in Ezekiel 38 and 39 of an invasion of Israel that could happen at any time now because the international conditions and the political alignments required by the prophecy are now amazingly enough in place. And that's only been true uh, really now. It wasn't quite, quite in place before. Let's look at verse 1 to 6. Now the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshesh, and Tubal. We showed last time that that's Russia and possibly Turkey. And prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Russia, Meshesh, and Tubal. And I'll turn you around, put hooks in your jaws, and lead you out with all your army, horses and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, that's Iran, Cush, that's Sudan, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Goma and all its trues, troops, the house of Togomar from the far north, now that's Turkey, and all its troops, many peoples also. Other nations will be with you. So there'll be a whole coalition of nations invading Israel that are led by Russia. And we'll soon see that this number of nations, God is actually bringing them into judgment by causing them to come together in this invasion of Israel. And they're led by Russia, include many of the former Soviet republics, Turkey, Sudan, Libya, Iran, and many others like Syria, Lebanon, uh, Gaza, and probably Jordan as well, if we look at Ezekiel 36, 1 to 5. Now, these are all Islamic nations, apart from Russia. And of course, they would like to see Israel destroyed. They're on good terms with Russia. And so this prophecy makes perfect sense in the light of today's politics and could easily be tomorrow's newspaper contents. And the, the one nation that was not in place before was Turkey, because it was allied with the West. But that's changed very recently. It's turned against Israel. It's got closer to Russia. And now we can easily see Turkey as being part of this coalition. And that's only happened in the last week or so. Now, does the vocabulary of warfare here mean that they're going to come on horses with shields, helmets and swords, bows, arrows and jav javelins like in ancient warfare? No. The prophet was limited to his own language. They didn't have specific words for tanks and missiles and so on. But uh, he used the most appropriate words to communicate their armament. And in any case, the Hebrew words are flexible enough to include the modern equivalent. The word translated horse, for example, means a leaper, a bird, or a chariot rider. This is language from 2,500 years ago being used to describe a mechanized force. Today we call motorized infantry cavalry in the same way, you see. Um, the sword is cherub, is a term, general term for any weapon or destroying instrument. The word for arrow means piercer and can be used for a thunderbolt. It could be used today for a missile or a bullet. A bow is what launches the arrow. That could be a gun or a missile launcher. And so we could, for example, translate Ezekiel 39.3 as, I will smite your launchers from your left hand and cause your missiles to fall out of your right hand. In other words, God's going to disarm these invading forces. The language used by Ezekiel means this is a massive, well-organized, equipped army. The fact that it had horses means it's, got, it's not just foot soldiers. They've, they have transportation. That would have been impressive to the original hearers. Where do they invade? Israel. Israel regathered from the nations back in her land. Verse 7 it says, prepare yourself and be ready, you and all your armies that are gathered around you, and be a guard for them. This is speaking to Gog, will be the leader, the one who builds this coalition. Verse 8 says, after many days you'll be visited. In the latter years this will be at the end of the age. You will come into the land of those brought back from the sword, gathered from many peoples on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate. They were brought out of the nations. Now all of them dwell securely. The target is Israel. That's been regathered to a land after being scattered for a long time, almost 2,000 years, to the nations. They've, she'd been oppressed 
in many of these nations under the sword. But now she dwells securely. Why? Because she has again become her own sovereign nation in her land. And she's restoring it from desolation. And in this time, with Israel back in the land, at the end of the, the age, this invasion takes place. And this prophecy has indeed been fulfilled in the last century. And although Israel is still in unbelief concerning a Messiah, this was also prophesied here because it's only after this battle that we read in Ezekiel that many in Israel and the nations will turn to the Lord as a result of the divine intervention in this situation. So, again, um, Israel is back in the land but not yet in faith. That's when this invasion takes place. So again we see present conditions are lined up for this prophecy to be fulfilled. Israel's in the land. Russia is a superpower to the north that is against Israel. Now, verse 9. You, he says, Gog and all his armies will ascend, coming like a storm, covering the land like a cloud. You and all your troops and many nations with you. This describes a sudden, overwhelming, unstoppable force coming against Israel, overcoming all resistance, covering the whole land. In the face of these massive armies, Israel's situation seems to be hopeless. All the defenses are broken, the, the armies cover the land. Verse 10, thus says the Lord God, on that day it will come to pass that thoughts will arise in your mind and you'll make an evil plan. You will say, I'll go up against the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to a peaceful people who dwell securely, all of them dwelling without wars, having neither bars nor gates to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against the people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the earth. No doubt Gog and his armies justify themselves as a force of liberation, but their true evil motives are revealed here. The nation of regathered Israel that they are attacking are peaceful, it says. They only want peace. They don't want war. In other words, they will be the innocent victims of this attack. Gog's motive, real, really, is for selfish gain. It's for power and wealth. He's the aggressor. Israel is des described as a, a land of unwalled villages, which is a perfect description of the kibbutzim that they're known for. Gog is aware that Israel is a strong, prospering nation with a strategic position in the Middle East, the center of the earth. And therefore, by invading her, he can not just strip her assets, but more importantly, secure a strategic foothold in the Middle East, enabling him to control much of the world's oil supply. The real motive, therefore, is not liberation, but expansion of her empire. Gog will see his opportunity to strike. Although Israel is dwelling securely, because she's got a strong military and strong allies who will defend her, Gog perceives that she's actually vulnerable to a sudden invasion by many nations acting together on many fronts. Her national defenses are insufficient. It says he sees that she's without walls, bars, gates. This is symbolic language that she's essentially defenseless against this force. This vulnerability, you see, is increased by the fact that Israel will not be expecting such a coordinated invasion of many nations. And the fact that Israel is such a small piece of land, it's hard to defend and uh, easier to overwhelm quickly. Gog may also perceive that Israel's un increasing unpopularity in the world means that her allies are less likely to come quickly to her defense. And especially if her main ally had weakened in its resolve to defend her, to appease the other nations. And so Gog sees his opportunity, organizes a massive sudden invasion, and he'll reckon that it, it will all be over before anyone can respond decisively, and then it will be too late, you see. He'll calculate the West will not be willing to immediately go to World War III and nuke, be nuclear. Um, they'll back down from that, especially since they're not just dealing with Russia alone, but a whole coalition of many nations. We're told what Russia's motivation will be. We're not told what the other nations are motivated by, but they must have their own reason for seeing Israel illuminated. And we know what this reason is from this current situation because all the nations allied with Russia are Islamic. And 
of course, they see Israel as their enemy, and Israel standing in the way of Islam's advance. And so the evil motives of Russia and so forth, uh, and the opportunity that arises to fulfill their ambitions, these are the, the hooks in their jaws that God will use to bring them into judgment for their rejection of God and their, their hatred of God's people, Israel. Verse 3, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshesh, and Tubal. I'll turn you around towards Israel. I'll put hooks in your jaws, and I'll lead you out to Israel. And we see that actually God is in ultimate control of the situation. Although Gog is responsible for his own plans and actions, of course, God will overrule and use them even to bring him into judgment by causing him to come against Israel and then to judge him. And God will pour out his judgment, as we're going to see, on those nations. And as a result of this, the name of the God of Israel will be glorified, not just in Israel, but throughout the world. God will turn this around for his glory. Now, there are nations that know Russia's real motive is not liberation, but to take control of the Middle East. And so they register their protest. But it seems that's all they're able to do. They don't declare war on Russia, for example. We read about that protest in verse 13. It says, Sheba Didan. Now, those are the Arabian states, Saudi Arabia particularly. They are presently al allied with the West. And uh, their existence, you see, would be threatened by Russia and Iran coming down and taking control of the Middle East. So it makes perfect sense that they would object, you see, that they would oppose. They would be against Russia doing this because they would be the next target, especially now that the USA would be cut out of the region. And so they would certainly object. And then it says also the merchants of Tarshish. And this describes Western Europe. And the, these merchants traded as far as Spain and the UK too. So there's the UK in prophecy, the merchants of Tarshish. And all their young lions, that's the colonies, and of course, when uh, the, the UK is the lion, isn't it? And then the young lions, uh, the colonies like the USA, they also will object. So we've got the Western Europe and the USA and the Commonwealth will object, of course, and say, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? See what a weak objection this is. It's just a question. They're really saying... Your motives are not what you're pretending. You've actually come to take power and wealth. But they don't declare war. They don't really put up much resistance. They leave Israel to her destruction. Well, that's what you would expect in the current situation. Of course, Europe and America would lose her oil supplies. She would be greatly weakened by all of this. But yet they're not strong enough to truly confront Russia. And so Israel is overwhelmed and her allies, it seems, are not coming to her rescue. I think God designed this because God is going to do it himself. Nobody's going to be able to say, well, some military power did it. But God is going to deal with this invasion all by himself. Israel trusts in America to defend her. But in this situation, America is not going to come through for her. Israel needs to put her trust in God. And she's going to find that her God will fight for her. And as a result, there'll be a great revival of faith in Israel and the nations. And so Israel's sin now is trusting the USA rather than God to defend her. And in this crisis, though, none of her allies is going to rescue her. And the invasion seems to be successful with Israel overwhelmed in such a state that she's on the point of annihilation. Only God can save them. And I believe God, at this point, Israel will turn to God for deliverance. And he will show himself strong to Israel, and he will be glorified. And many in the nations will come to faith as a result. And this could happen any time now. Verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, On that day when my people Israel shall dwell safely, will you not know it? 
Then you will come from your place out of the far north, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days that I will bring you up against my land so that the nations may know me when I'm sanctified in you, O Gog, before their eyes. Here we see in the last days, Gog comes out of, from the far north of Israel, Russia. And notice now God identifies himself with Israel and with the land. He says, they're my people and it's my land. In other words, Gog, you're not coming, you think you're coming against Israel, but actually you're coming against me, the God of Israel. You're going to have to deal with me. Israel's in covenant with God under his protection. He will not let them be destroyed. And he'll find that Gog will find that he meets God. God's purpose in this invasion, in allowing it, is that he will be sanctified in the eyes of the nations by the miraculous divine intervention that he will save Israel with. And it is God, the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, who will be sanctified and glorified and s as the true God in the eyes of many nations. Many will come to faith by this obvious divine intervention because it will be nothing to do with Israel's military might or America's power. What will God do? Well, he will judge and destroy these armies. Verse 17, thus says the Lord God, Are you he of whom I've spoken in the former days by my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied it for years in those days that I would bring you against them? Now, the answer to this question is no. You see, formerly many of the prophets had prophesied invasions from the north against Israel, which would be successful such as the Assyrians and the Babylonians. These were successful because God was disciplining Israel for her sin and causing her to go into captivity. But God now is actually making it clear to Gog that this invasion is not the fulfillment of all those previous prophecies and therefore Gog has no basis for imagining that he, God will allow it to succeed. This is a brand new prophecy that hadn't been is not in the word of God anywhere else in which the invaders will come under judgment because God is going to fight for Israel. Therefore God declares in verse 18, it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury against Gog and his armies will show in my face. God's going to get angry. How will he destroy them? He's going to use three weapons including orchestrating the forces of nature against the invaders. These are weapons he's used before in the Old Testament, but never on this scale, never altogether. This will be actually on a greater scale than all the Old Testament miracles. This will be one of the most dramatic divine interventions in all history. Number one, by a great earthquake. That's in verse 19. He says, for in my jealousy to protect Israel and in the fire of my wrath I've spoken surely in that day it's all going to happen in one day of the invasion God's going to open up his artillery there will be a great earthquake in the land of Israel so that the fish of the sea the birds of the air the beasts of the field all creeping things that creep on the earth and all men on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence the mountains will be thrown down the steep places shall fall and every wall shall fall to the ground this will devastate and paralyze the invading force. And then secondly, he talks about friendly fire, civil war, infighting, confusion, in the, it probably caused by the earthquake. Verse 21, I will call for a sword against Gog throughout my mountain, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother. And these invading armies will start killing each other in the panic and confusion. And then thirdly, even worse, pestilence, blood, f floods, hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Verse 22, I'll bring into judgment, God says, with pestilence, that's plagues will break out. That's probably the worst thing of all. And bloodshed, I will rain down on him and his troops and the many with him. Flooding rain, great hailstones, fire and brimstone. God is basically blasting with everything he's got. Well, not everything, but floods will stop the armies in their tracks and sweep them away. Great fires, hailstones, worst of all, deadly diseases will sweep through these armies. Basically, every man in these armies will be killed in one day, completely destroyed. And this will be a sign to the nations that uh, God is alive and well to magnify himself.
that they might know that the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, is truly God. Verse 23, then I'll magnify myself and sanctify myself and I will be known in the eyes of many nations. Then they will know that I am the Lord, you see. Chapter 39 retells the story showing the details of the cleanup operation afterwards. Son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, Prince of Rosh, Meshesh, and Tubal, and I'll turn you around and lead you on, bringing you up from the far north and bring you against the mountains of Israel. And actually, these mountains are throughout Israel, but they certainly include the West Bank, you see. So again, it's maybe a liberation force. Verse 3, Then I'll knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. He will disarm them. Verse 4, you will fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and peoples who are with you. I'll give you to the birds of prey of every sort and the beast of the field to be devoured. You will fall on the open field for I have spoken, says the Lord God. The army will be destroyed in a day. The land of Russia will also and the other nations will be devastated by fire. Maybe from human weapons or again by divine intervention. Using, the, using elements of nature. Verse 6 says, I will send fire on Magog, as Russia and maybe Turkey, and on those who live in security in the coastlands. Then they will know that I am the Lord. And this, the result will be a revival of faith in Israel and the nations. Verse 7, I'll make my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations will know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel, in Israel, you see, surely it's coming and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I've spoken. You see, when Israel was scattered to the nations, God's name, his reputation was profaned among the nations because they were his covenant people, but it seemed like he wasn't fulfilling his promises to them. And this would cause the nations to doubt that the God of the Bible, the God of Israel, is truly almighty God, what he claimed to be. To profane means to treat something that is truly holy and unique as ordinary. He's just like all the other gods that don't exist. Well, the result of this intervention in the midst of Israel will be to declare his holy name to the nations. They will profane his name no more. They will know that there is a God of Israel, that there is the, the God of the Bible, is the true God. He's different from all those other so-called gods. There is none like him. And they will know and many will come to faith and turn back to the Bible. And this is why I'm sharing this message, so that when this actually happens, you will be ready to lead people to Christ. You will show them, Ezekiel 38, that this was all prophesied. And you will be able to lead them to realize, that, the, to know the God of the Bible. Well, in verse 9 and 10, we're told that for seven years are needed to dismantle and destroy the enemy weapons and they're going to make fires for seven years and then in verse 11 to 13 it says that seven months are taken and it describes how it's done seven months are taken by the whole population to bury the dead everyone's involved in burying the dead there's going to be so many of them it's going to take the, the nation seven months to do it and in verse 14 to 16 it says even after those seven months a professional team has to be uh, established that will seek out and find any remaining bodies, mark where they are, and then another team is going to come along and bury them. There'll be an organized system for seven months and beyond for burying the dead. And, and a new city, a place will be designated, a certain valley for, the, for this burial that will create a huge mound. And also a city will be built there. And that tells me that, in fact, it's not going to be happen right at the end of time. It's going to happen possibly in the time now, even a number of years before the tribulation. When will this happen? Well, there's some possibilities. Number one, some say after the millennium. Chapter, tw chapter 20 of Revelation talks about the millennium uh, and then uh, an invasion of Gog and Magog. But it can't be this because of the seven years afterwards because after the millennium, the whole earth is destroyed anyway, so there can't be a seven-year cleanup operation. Some say it's the Battle of Armageddon, but after the tribulation. But again, that would have them cleaning up uh, after in seven years into the millennium, which doesn't make sense. There are other reasons too I don't have time to cover. Some say it's at mid-tribulation, 
But again, the seven-year cleanup operation would take you into the millennium, which doesn't make sense. These views can't be right. It must, because it takes seven years to clean up the land. And you see, when the millennium starts, the whole land is cleansed and renovated anyway. So that it must be at least seven years before Christ's return. Therefore, it's either very early on in the tribulation, which is seven years, or before the tribulation begins. And I think God's kept both options open because of the doctrine of imminency, which means Christ could come in the rapture at any time. So it could be before or after. Both qualify as being in the latter days, the time of end time prophecy being fulfilled. But we have shown that there's nothing in all the descriptions of Israel and the invading nations that tell us that, it, that, that is not true today. We could say it could happen, therefore, at any time. It could happen before the tribulation, and I think this is the most likely situation. That's why I'm sharing this message with you, so that you're ready. This invasion could happen at any time, so that you can bring people to the Lord. Russia could invade Israel. There could be a great earthquake destroying the Dome of the Rock that occupies where the temple is. And as a result, many nations will turn to God. There'll be a great opportunity then for the church to reap a final harvest before the rapture. And with Russia dest destroyed, there'll be a power vacuum which will be filled by the rise of revived Rome, the United Europe powers, of which Antichrist will originally, uh, eventually take the leadership. Islam will have suffered a great blow you see, because most of its fundamentalist nations will be involved in this judgment. And this is politically orientated, so it will be very sensitive to a major defeat. And many Muslims will probably realize that they will look for answers in the Bible and pray God that they will receive the Lord Jesus. And this will revive faith in Israel in her God and strengthen moves to rebuild her temple, especially with the Islamic op opposition being greatly weakened and she'll do that eventually with Rome's help, revived Rome's help through the covenant with Antichrist. This will demonstrate that God is not finished with Israel. He's the God of Israel and he will judge all nations that curse Israel and come against Israel. So watch and pray because this event could happen at any time now.